I have talked to over a hundred protesters now. I don't call them pro-democracy because a lot of them do not actually support democracy, but they have more reactionary views. From all my conversations with them so far, I haven't seen a single protester that was able to justify their support for the riots yet. It has become very apparent to me that most of them are just blindly engaging in destructive and disruptive behavior because they are frustrated with the current situation, but they don't offer any kind of actual valid arguments or constructive solutions for the actual problems that exist. What's causing their problem? It's capitalism. It's not the Communist Party infusing their city with communism, forcing them to lose their jobs. No, it's just competition on a free market <laughs> that is causing their frustrations. People complaining about this law often have never read it because whenever they make references to it, they cannot actually cite from this law specific statements, but simply make things up. If China really is not a country of law, it doesn't need this national security law to simply take you whenever they want. Most of them just repeat propaganda that they picked up from Western media because they copy their statements one to one without any original or independent thought. It is no longer their birthright to be better than mainlanders. They have to accept that reality because China is developing. My Damen und Herren, guten Tag. Welcome to a new episode of Soft Talk, where unlike BBC's Hard Talk, the interviewees won't find it hard to talk. Today, we're very honoured to have a guest from Austria. He's Lars from Vienna. So Lars, do you mind introducing yourself to our audience? Hi, Kibros. Uh, nice meeting you. <laughs> My name is Lasse Boysen. I'm originally from Germany, but I have been living in Austria for the past 12 years of my life. I am running my own NGO here with a focus on China, bringing education to people who need it, be it businesses, be it individuals, politicians or just smaller groups that have some kind of interest in China but don't know how to approach the subject or how to understand certain regulations coming out of China. Danke schön. So without further ado, let's begin with the first question. What do you think of the situation in Hong Kong in the past two years? I'm very concerned about the situation itself in Hong Kong. Hong Kong actually has a very special place in my heart. When I first came to China in the summer of 2009, I traveled to Hong Kong for a few days. It actually quickly became my favorite city in China. It probably was at one of the top spots in terms of human global development that I've seen at that point. It was very beautiful, especially at night. It it was very culturally rich, very diverse. It was extremely free in terms of people's discussions about politics, references to media, and it had fantastic food. When I returned to Europe, I kept an active interest in Hong Kong, kept wanting to go back and keep in contact with my friends from Hong Kong. I do understand the frustrations of the youth in Hong Kong. I absolutely understand everything these people feel. I'm talking to my friends from Hong Kong, this is something that all of them share, be they on the side of the protests or against the protests, they all have a very big concern for their city and its future, very big frustrations with how their city is developing. So I do support people's right to protest. There is no question about my supporting of the people's right to voice their opinions publicly to their government. It's very important. And of course, you should be able to do so. I also don't think there's any question about the fact that the future of young people in Hong Kong is very uncertain and that a lot of privileges that Hong Kongers have enjoyed as a consequence of their social status as citizens of this A to China city that they grew up with will inevitably be lost as Hong Kong integrates further into a global market with uh, China in a dominant position. That's simply a natural consequence of human development and also of Hong Kong's integration into the PRC. Until recently, Hong Kongers benefited from being the middleman between China and the West, but now they are slowly losing that role for a variety of reasons that I don't only blame Hong Kongers for, obviously. And so young people in Hong Kong now have to compete on an increasingly more open and more integrated market with people from the mainland. They will compete for jobs, for living space. And obviously now, today, they need to work much harder than their parent generations to keep living at the top of Chinese society. It is no longer their birthright, given privilege, to be better than mainlanders. They have to accept that reality because China is developing and they cannot keep going on living that dream of privilege forever. So on the one hand, 
I do understand that some sort of protests are good and maybe even necessary. When you have very valid concerns, you should protest and make your voices heard. However, over the past two years, the frustrations and the energy of the people that is coming from a very good place has been co-opted by very hostile special interest groups with very destructive agendas especially foreign interest groups that are leading these groups of protesters from anti-Chinese governments, such as the US government that has an active interest in obviously splitting China and causing social unrest. One piece of the puzzle is yes, there are justified reasons to protest, but on the other hand, no, there is no justification for what's actually happening in the streets when it comes to these active riots, as we have seen from videos that are freely available online, but that the Western media doesn't seem to like to show people that are filled with actual terrorists that are stabbing politicians, violently attacking police officers without provocation, beating up innocent bystanders just for voicing their opinions. That is completely unacceptable. And so is all the destruction surrounding these protests. You cannot invade legislative buildings or police buildings and destroy their property buying hostile foreign flags like American flags or the British colonial flag. How do people even justify that in their heads if they care about their city? Just a follow-up question. Have you talked to some of the protesters here in Hong Kong? And and what do you make of like some of their demands, which they've given in the past two years? I have talked to a significant amount of protesters. Actually, out of all the people in Hong Kong I talk to, most of them are protesters. I don't call them pro-democracy because from my perspective, a lot of them do not actually support democracy, but they have more reactionary views. I have talked to over 100 protesters now. I think the exact number is 112. I also keep a record of all my conversations with them, their arguments, what they feel most strongly about. My original goal was to talk to at least one of these protesters per day, but due to time reasons, and the availability of these people for debate, it hasn't been that easy. And to be quite honest, unfortunately, from all my conversations with them so far, it has become very apparent to me that most of them are just blindly engaging in destructive and disruptive behavior because they are frustrated with the current situation, but they don't offer any kind of actual valid arguments or constructive solutions for the actual problems that exist. I can acknowledge problems that they point out might be real, you know, the housing prices, exploding their frustrations about finding a job in the future, their competition with the mainlanders that are coming to Hong Kong to live and work, but they don't offer actual constructive solutions. A lot of them are very reactionary in their views. They hate mainlanders. They just hate communism irrationally because ultimately what's causing their problem, their current system that is enabling mainlanders to come in, buy up everything, it's capitalism. It's not the communist party infusing their city with communism, forcing them to lose their jobs and uh, lose their homes. No, it's just competition on a free market <laughs> that is causing their frustrations. And so I think, first of all, their hatred for communism is misguided. And secondly, their hatred for mainlanders themselves is completely misguided because obviously they are part of China. Most of them acknowledge that fact. So I do not understand any of these violent riots, especially directed at mainlanders. So far, I haven't seen a single protester, even though talking to them regularly, that was able to justify their support for the riots yet. Most of them just repeat propaganda that they picked up from Western media, at least from what I can see, because they copy their statements one-to-one, -one, what they hear on the media, they just repeat them as their personal opinions without any original or independent thought. It's very concerning for me. It doesn't even have to be Western publications, but also publications like Apple Daily that are funded by billionaires that have now been found guilty of very criminal acts that obviously had their own agendas for why they want to manipulate public opinion and turn people against the mainland because it threatens their own economic interests. To all of your viewers, I would like to pose a challenge. Anyone who would like to challenge me in any of my personal opinions that I'm expressing here as part of this interview is free to contact me. I will give my contact details and the contact details of my NGO to the key bros here. I will try to talk to each and every one of you personally. You can prove me wrong and convince me otherwise. I want to have a debate with you because as part of my work for my NGO, I seek to engage you people and also explain to Western audiences what's happening in China and why. And the more I know about you, the better I'm able to do my job. Austria is one of the countries which opposed the enactment of the controversial Hong Kong national security law in the UN Human Rights Council. On their official Twitter account, the Austrian Foreign Ministry has voiced concerns of the situation here in Hong Kong many times too. 
including on the postponing of legislative council elections and detainments of opposition representatives. So what do you think of the foreign ministry stance? Is the national security law a curtailment of freedom of speech or a necessary act to prevent foreign interference and terrorism. Mostly I was not aware of the Austrian negative statements against China, but I have seen now that the Austrian government uh, official foreign ministry spokespeople, at least on Twitter, have voiced opposition to the national security law in Hong Kong. And I've seen that they basically just copied the stance of other U European Union representatives. They are endorsing a speech by the UK ambassador, endorsing the comments by Christoph Heusken in front of the UN. I have now sought contact to the Austrian government to discuss their stance and what they base their positions on. But as far as I'm concerned, they are literally just copying and pasting what others are saying without taking an adequate discussion of these topics in mind. I would personally wish for the Austrian government to engage more with the Chinese government about these concerns and have an honest and open discussion and maybe even a public discussion of all of the concerns they have when it comes to this law and constructive uh, feedback for how this law should be changed to better reflect what Austria considers universal human rights, which it claims it doesn't represent now. Personally, I read the law in full. I'm not a legal specialist. I know that you have now graduated a law degree yourself, so you are probably better qualified to understand the real ramifications of this piece of legislation. However, when I compare it to existing legislation and case law in other countries, I don't think there is anything special about it. In fact, it seems to be quite lenient in its wording and its intended goals and intended punishments for specific criminal acts. I also get the feeling that the people complaining about this law often have never read it because whenever they make references to it, they cannot actually cite from this law specific statements, but simply make things up. They say this law will lead to people arbitrarily being detained in Hong Kong and extradited to China to face secret trials. This is such an absurd statement for me, considering that the law explicitly states that this is not possible, but that anything that people would be prosecuted for in the PRC for something that happens in Hong Kong must first be prosecutable in Hong Kong and Hong Kong legal experts need to verify that yes, this person can be extradited to the PRC. So I think these concerns are completely ridiculous. If China really is not a country of law, it doesn't need this national security law to simply take you whenever they want. Why would they even do this law then? Make up your mind. Either China is a country of law or isn't. And if it is, this national security law makes sense and doesn't instill this dystopian society that you believe it does. Or China isn't a country of law and you don't have to worry about this law anyway because everything will stay the way it is. Thank you very much for watching. This is the end of part one. In part two, we'll be discussing mainly EU-China relations because our guest has some very unique insights into how the EU and Austria work in relation to China. So please stay tuned for that. Also, a little update on our part. Currently, I am based in Europe to finish off my studies while my fellow Kibro is back in Hong Kong. However, despite our physical separation, we'll still try to pump and publish some videos for you guys. Some exciting news as well. We have recently been invited by some very kind Hungarians to go over to the country to debunk some of the Western media lies and also to perhaps organize some soft talks over there. So if all goes to plan, I'll be able to travel there within the next few weeks and bring you guys on the ground insights from Hungary. Also, we're trying to arrange some interviews with some Chagos Islanders who were forcibly expelled from their homeland by the UK and US governments in the 1960s to this very day. So this is also going to be a very interesting episode and I hope to see you guys in the next one. All right, I've read the scene. Bye.